two minutes. That's enough. Let's get started. So, like I said, welcome everybody to uh, our session Identify and Recall Patients at Risk of COVID 19. We'll be um, discussing uh, how you can identify patients, as the title says, but we also will be doing a little bit of um, data cleansing and looking at data quality in PenCAT. So, I'll be doing a bit of a quick sort of 101 on that. Um, but if you've got, if we're a small group today, so if you've got any questions, please stop us, take yourself off mute, and uh, please ask questions, put your hand up, put uh, information in, you know, in the chat. If you've got a comment, I will stop. We could sort of divert the session um, if you've got uh, anything in particular you want to know about. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, do acknowledgement of country, so Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network um, would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. We recognise their continued connection to the land, waters and culture and would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. A little bit of housekeeping. So um, all attendees are on mute. Um, but like I said, there's we're just a small group. So uh, you can either ask a question by the chat box. Um, the questions can be anonymous. We can have someone else ask them if uh, you don't want to take yourself off mute and have it um, and ask a question directly. So a little bit about the speakers. So Natalie Simpson Stewart. So Natalie has been a nurse for 15 years and a practice nurse for seven years. Um, uh, she's got a lot of uh, digital tools apparently for effective patient recalls and running efficient vaccination clinics. So there's a bit of a skill there on Natalie and then myself and I've been working for uh, Northwestern Melbourne PHN since 2015, working with uh, general practice um, and all things, uh, quality improvement and supporting practices in whatever they need support with at the moment. So I'm just gonna run through quickly on um, uh, cat fall filters and data cleansing. So uh, just a quick view of what uh, I think is a 101 uh, that I have practices ask me at times when I meet with them. So uh, firstly, this is usually the screen you'll, you'll find when you log into your uh, pen cat. And usually you will see, uh, you'll be able to select your extract to the left of your screen. That, that's an important um, area to know about. There's a help button. That's an important area to know about because that's where you find your cat user guides, your cat recipes, training, webinars and more. There's a filter button here that opens up your uh, filters. So you've got uh, layers of filters when you're looking at uh, different cohort of patients you want to look into. And always remember to uh, clear filters and recalculate when you're looking at your recipes. But I'm going to take you through some of that in a moment. Um, and also I just wanted to sort of touch a little bit on top bar because I find that top bar is such a good tool and practices that do use it do find it quite uh, useful. Um, it, it is a tool that will help you identify what's missing in a patient's database. So um, we'll have a look at that in a moment, um, but there will be a link. So these slides will all be coming out to you after this session. So this link will take you to this little video which I'll play later for you. Um, and and the, you'll see you'll see how useful it is because when you, you do actually um, go into top bar, you'll be able to see how interactive it is and how easily it will take you to where you need to go to start exploring um, your patient's uh, missing data. So I'm just going to quickly stop sharing my screen and bring up my pen cat and I will really share it there. So there you go, Natalie, you can see that again. Perfect. Okay. So this is PenCat, and usually when you come to, um, when you log on, you will arrive at this screen. You won't see all your data here at the bottom, but what you will see, that'll be blank. First thing you need to do is to go into your show extract, and all your extracts will be listed here. So the latest one will be at the top, so I've already selected the first one. Down here, this uh, area tells us, just shows us the patients in your database. So that's everybody 
at the moment, your duplicates, everyone in your database, females pink, male is blue, and it gives you the different ages that they're broken up into. If you just wanted a list of all these patients, you could easily just go to view population and this uh, will generate a report for you and you'll be able to uh, find a list of all the patients and you'll be able to see their first name, last name, their gender. Um, it tells you their date of birth and you can see, can you see that Natalie? The report I've brought across, thank you. Um, so you can see it's got all this information for you. Uh, where they live, uh, postcodes, phone numbers, you know, Medicare number, IHI, and also their assigned provider and the last time they've been to your practice. If you wanted, for example, to have a look and just reorder gender, sometimes you might have a list of patients that don't have a gender, and it's just as easy if you hover your mouse just over the, the word sex, it usually will turn into a little hand. And of course, because I'm presenting, it's not going to do that now. There you go. Um, and then if you click that, that will reorder your list um, by gender. Um, and then you would have your females will come up at the top, then your males, and then you'll have unidentified at the top there as well. But that's a quick sort of list, a report that you could just have a look at. This, remembering this report at the moment, say 778 pages. So it has, it is a big report. I wouldn't recommend you print it, but it could be something that you could then um, try and save into your database. So you could just go to save, select in which format you want to save it, and then save it on your system somewhere to refer to later. Um, just quickly up the top, we've got all these buttons along here. So collection, this is if you, you go to collection if you want to um, do an extract. We, the PHN usually has um, uh, receives extracts once a month. So there's a scheduler on most practices databases somewhere. There's a schedule on their system that will automatically uh, activate on the first of every month. And the extract then gets, you receive the identified data into your PENCS uh, portal and we will receive de-identified data at the PHN and that's part of the QR requirement. Um, but if you want to collect um, information, you could, uh, another extract, you would just go collect. I recommend you don't do that during the busy period at the practice because um, that could slow down your system. Report is if you select, uh, you'd actually go in and select a particular cohort in your uh, database and you wanted to just see a report, you click report and it brings up a, a sheet just like I showed you previously. Um, or it touched on that. Cat 4 is where we've logged into. Uh, cleansing Cat. That's basically the same as clicking on your data cleansing tab. So that'll show you these data cleansing um, tabs here at the bottom. Uh, register a cat, that's if you've got registries in the practice. Uh, daily cat gives you a view of similar view, but less tabs. So if you can see here, the tabs are just less. So cat four will give you a full view of all the, um, all the tabs available. Programs is based on if some practices and some PHNs might have different programs that you can have access to. Um, uh, health is probably another good area to look at. And here is where you can find a lot of the links um, that will assist you once you're working through. So your cat recipes are a good uh, thing to refer to if you're a particular uh, information you're looking for. You can probably find the steps in your cat recipes. Also has some training and webinars, so live training and webinars that have uh, previously occurred and you can watch them. They're usually about 30 minutes, so worth the watch. The other quick thing I just wanted to have a look at is filters. So usually uh, you start off the page like this, then you would open your filters. In general, you would, you, you know, it's quite explanatory. So if I wanted to, for example, look at just males, I would click male patients, recalculate, and it would bring up all the males in the practice. So I can layer it. And then if I may, I might want to look at male indigenous patients. Again, you would, you, I'm looking at my males, indigenous patients, recalculate, and that number's going to change, it's going to tell me it's 30. Then if I want to look at conditions, I might go in and say, you know, male and so on. You understand, you know, I would click yes to diabetes and I'd be able to see my diabetic male patients. Who, um, with indigenous ethnicity. 
So every time you do select the measures, remember to always go in clear and recalculate so it takes you back for you to be ready for your next recipe. So basically this here, you know, gender, you can select by gender, DVA, health cover, um, age, if you want to look at a particular cohort of patients by age, last visit, first visits, um, activity, a lot of the recipes will start um, and ask you to select active patients, three by two, um, because that is what the uh, accreditation standards are based most of your um, accreditation on. Um, so all of every time we look at your patient's information, your PQI reports are all based on your active patients. Postcodes, you can select patients by postcodes. Ethnicity, you can come in here. Um, in your PQI reports, you've got the uh, ethnicity. If you've got patients that are um, not recorded or stated, this is where you would come in, click on that, and you'd be able to find the list of patients. Conditions, you can choose patients by condition. If an example is if I look at diabetes and I want all the diabetic patients, I would say yes. And whatever disappears is what I've selected. So gestational hasn't been selected, but everything else, type two, type one, and unidentified diabetic patient has been selected. And someone with respiratory and cardiovascular. Cardiovascular, if I say yes, it captures everything under cardiovascular. But if I actually just wanted the cardi uh, cardiovascular disease, I would click it there and you see only that part of the, um, the information is, has been uh, flagged and that's what we'll bring up in the recipe and so on. It's quite explanatory. Medications are the same. Uh, date range results, you can select by uh, you know, 12 months, 15 months, or you can actually do it a date range. Visits, similar, and so on. And you can see patients. Um, providers is another good one. If you've got a GP and you want to uh, have a look and see what particular GP's data looks like, you would actually go in here and you can actually select one GP in particular, um, recalculate and it'll bring up that particular GP's uh, patients. And then you can start doing your, um, your different reports on particular GPs or providers, I should say. Uh, risk factors, so again, let's clear. Okay, and you recalculate, so we're back at the beginning. Risk factors, again, you can choose your patient by risk factors. MBS items, uh, Natalie will talk about that later. And then saved filters. If you've got a report that you, you want to look at uh, periodically and you want to make sure that it's extracted correctly, um, I would say you could bring up a report, you go into here, you then save, give it a title and you can then direct staff to come back to this particular report rather than going in and selecting all your fields individually. So that sort of gives you a quick sort of um, 101 on filters. Um, the other thing we were going to look at was quickly uh, was data quality. Um, data quality, this is, uh, this is a traffic light uh, uh, report and it looks at your accreditation standard. Uh, this here, you can, you can have a look. So, for example, it, this first one here, allergies and adverse reactions. So, in my report here, it's telling me I'm at amber. So, I'm at 84.71%. If you go along, there's a resource here that you click on. It does say fourth edition, but it does apply to the fifth edition standards. And it gives you a bit of rationale about um, how that, that report is extracted and, and the information behind that. If you go to the next tab here, the data completeness report, that explains that first graph a little bit more. Um, we then have your data completeness graph. But if you want to look at your data quality, I would say, you know, every quarter or every month, you might want to make a habit to just pop into this report here, which looks at your duplicated patients and your duplicated patients by number and duplicated patients by name. So this report here, of course, mine's all de identified. So Everybody is a duplicate, but anybody that's got the same Medicare number, healthcare card number, or DVA number will pop up on this um, report. And then on the second one, anybody that has the same name. So the, the system will identify if a patient's gone into, if you've got um, online booking, a patient might go in and, and themselves online and create a duplicate uh, record in your system. This is where you would pick it up. Here, 
Um, but it also does pick up twins. So just be careful if you, you know, if you are going through it, you might have twins that um, you would have to, and that'll just keep picking them up regardless. Um, you can't stop that happening, but this is where you would go. Um, I think that's it. I think that's a quick 101. I hope that's um, that's enough. I was going to quickly sort of play this little video on uh, PENCAT for everybody, and I'm hoping you'll be able to, to hear it. So let me just see if I can do that again. I will stop and find it on my system. Here we go. Sorry, bear with me. All right, so this little video here, which I've got permission from PenCS to play because I don't have access to all this data. So if with PenCat, I just want to, just a 101, when a patient comes into your um, waiting area and they're admitted into your, um, uh, into your system, top bar will actually come up and flag for you uh, if there's any missing information. So you would, these little uh, buttons will come up and tell you what's missing in particular patient's information. So this view here is the clinical view. So the patient, when the GP has the patient in front of them, they'll be able to see what's missing um, on the patient's database. So this clinical view tells the GP or the nurse that this is the allergies and the diagnosis coded um, has been, is correct, but their alcohol, height, weight, um, weight, waste, smoking, and et cetera is missing. You just need to click the button. If you click the button, that should actually go directly to your clinical software and it should start to, um, uh, it'll open up exactly where you, sorry, I'm gonna mute that because I've been told you can't hear it. So yeah, so you can see it goes through, um, you can click on demographic, it'll, it'll open up into the clinical software exactly where you need to put your information in. So you don't really need to go through the patients through your clinical software to find exactly the, the spot to put the information in. But this video is actually in the slide. So just take time, have a look. If you do want top bar installed and you don't have it installed at your practice, let us know. Um, there are some uh, links in our um, slides that we'll be sending out on how to contact top bar, uh, how to contact NCS. Um, and that's it, I'm done. I'll stop sharing and over to Natalie now, who is going to talk about um, finding patients uh, for COVID vaccinations. Okay. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. 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 Yeah, beautiful. Um, so we will get on to the topic of how to find people that need um, more COVID vaccines, but I thought given the advice that was released from ATAGI yesterday evening, I thought we'd just quickly run through sort of some dot points of what came out with that latest advice. So not that there's many of them left, but those people that haven't yet had their primary course of COVID vaccine. So the recommendation for mRNA vaccine, so our Pfizer and our Moderna, the guidance is that that should now be given eight weeks apart, particularly in people 40 and under. Two reasons. One is to reduce the risk of pericarditis and myocarditis um, in relation to the vaccine, but also to boost effectiveness. So having that bigger lag period between the two doses to try and prompt greater memory T cell creation later on. For people over the age of 40, particularly sort of 60 and over, or people that are going to be traveling overseas imminently, we can reduce that interval to three weeks because their risk of um, from COVID is greater than people that are just staying in Australia doing their day-to-day -day things. In terms of the Novavax vaccine or Nuvaxovid, we can extend the interval to eight weeks if patients want to, um, to potentially increase the effectiveness. We don't have any data on how much of an impact that greater interval would be for Nuvax Ovid. And we also don't have a lot of evidence on the rates of myocarditis and pericarditis on post Nuvax Ovid immunization at either interval. So it's a discussion you can have with patients if you are doing the Nuvax Ovid. Um, 
really be guided by, you know, what's happening with them and in their lives and their risk. In terms of boosters, so congratulations, Australia, Delta, not so much of an issue anymore, which is very exciting. Our dominant strain here is Omicron. Um, what we've found is that post-Omicron infection generally will provide some immunity for about 80 days post-resolution of acute illness. So the guidance is now to wait three months post-COVID infection before giving the next new dose of COVID vaccine. So if they've had their first dose of their primary course, you would wait until three months post-recovery to give their second dose. If they've had their primary course and they're waiting on their booster, we're going to wait that three months before we give them their booster. Likewise, with our patients that are dual winter booster, again, waiting that three months. Once they hit that three month mark, we should be trying to give that dose as soon as possible. I have popped the links to this latest advice in the references at the back of my slides, which you will have later. So let's crack on with the initial plan, which was to talk about COVID-19 vaccines and PENCAP. Um, so as Egon said, my name's Natalie. I've been nursing for 15 years and I work at Summit Medical Group in Brunswick. So optimising COVID vaccination. Why? It's been nice. We haven't really had to think about it as much recently, which has been great, but just a bit of a refresh. So the primary course is two doses of all vaccines plus a third dose for people with severe immunocompromisation who are aged over five. Booster dose is recommended for everyone that over the age of 16 and over who have had at least a three-month interval post their second dose from the primary course or their third course if they're immunocompromised or three months post their COVID infection. Winter boosters, uh, so what we're calling the older people boosters, are recommended for people aged 65 and over, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders aged 50 and over, residents of residential aged care facilities and people aged 16 and over with severe immunocompromise four months after their previous dose. So for your people with severe immunocompromise, they're now going to have had five COVID vaccinations in total. The reason we're doing it for this group is that more likely they end up hospitalised, but they're also more likely to have had a reduced immune response to each of those vaccinations. So it's really trying to get those antibody levels up before we head into winter. Okay. So in terms of using PENCAT, so why data collection is so important? We need to find out those patients who haven't yet been vaccinated. So there are going to be those people that don't want to be vaccinated, but there are going to be those people that have potentially been scared or hesitant or who have just, you know, for whatever reason, have been putting it off. So knowing who those people are so we can target those conversations. We can identify those people who are partially vaccinated or they're due for a booster dose. We can actually help identify people that are at a higher risk that may not be aware that they're a higher risk. And I'll go through who these people are a little bit later. Obviously, boosters, and I'm sure you're all copying the question of, oh, when am I going to need another booster? So particularly for those people who are really early on, they've had their primary course, they've had their first booster, and now they're waiting. Well, it's been a while since I've had my last booster. When are we due to do another one? So we know at some point that we are going to need to do a booster. There's a lot of research going on at the moment about the co-administration of flu and COVID at the same time at the same site. So Boosters are coming for the general population. We just don't know when. It's going to be really great if you have that data to hand when that time comes. The other big thing is you are a trusted source of information, particularly practice nurses. We know nurses have probably the greatest influence on vaccine hesitant people, more so than doctors and specialists. So you are important. You having those conversations is important and you can really impact vaccine hesitancy amongst your patients. So who are these risky people that need a COVID booster? So the first thing is making sure your coding in your software is really, really good. If you have people whose diagnoses aren't coded correctly, you're not going to pick them up when you pull your data. So in best practice, if you want to find who you need to code, you'll go into Best Practice Premier Utilities, which lives in your start menu underneath Best Practice. And rather than the usual rainbow finch, you have a little black and orange finch. If you open up Best Premier Utilities and you come down to where the paintbrush shows cleanup history, it will then open the window on the right. And what you have in that list 
is any diagnoses or reasons for visit that have been saved as a free hand. And if you go through there, you will find people that have free handed diabetes for sure. So what you can do is highlight that uncoded past item. And then on the right hand box in the condition, you can actually choose what you'd like to code that as. So you can change a free handed from diabetes to a coded diabetes. Obviously, that would be then good if you went through and figured out which sort of diabetes they have, but we'll start with the basics. In medical director, which I don't use, but again, under your start menu, under medical director, you will find the section where it says maintenance. If you open that, you can see the section where it says diagnosis coder, and then you'll be opened up. And similar to the best practice, on the left hand, you'll have a list of free hands. On the right hand, you have your coding. So making sure that things are coded. Okay. So we have coded our data. Now we need to figure out who's not vaccinated and why. So looking at the general population, there is always going to be that section of the population that will not vaccinate for whatever reason, regardless of how much information they are given. But those people, it's not really worth spending a lot of energy on that group because they're not going to be influenced. And that's what research has found. So very small minority, put them in the too hard basket. The ones that we really want to focus on are the people that are sitting on the fence or who are a little bit hesitant or need more information and support to make a choice. Those are the people where if you spend the energy, they're, they're going to be thankful. Whether or not they choose to vaccinate remains with them, but they're the people who are going to appreciate the effort and potentially will move to a position of being vaccinated. When we talk about barriers to accessing vaccination, so um, Margie Danchin and Julie Leask, who are amazing, have done a working report on how we can improve COVID vaccination um, in Australia. And what they talk about is the five A's of barriers to vaccination. So we talk about access, affordability. Sorry. Oh, yeah. That's all right. I can't see us. We can't see your screen. Okay. Screen. Let me have a look. Why Zoom's having a moment. Um, okay, so let's try that. That one. How are we going now? Better or still not sharing? No, not sharing. Okay. You want me to share? No, no, that's all right. Um, let me. Nothing's go. coming in. Yeah, better. Better? All right, perfect. Yeah, thank you. That's all right. Okay, so we'll go back here. There we go. Everyone can see that one now? Perfect. Excellent. All right, so we talk about those five A's. So, and I'll go through these in a little bit more detail shortly. So we talk about access, affordability, awareness, acceptance, and activation. Now on the right, there's a little graph there, which was really great. Some studies that were done by Melbourne Uni. And what it was tracking was out of our Australian population, what adults were hesitant or were not keen to vaccinate. And so you can see looking from October 2020, so, you know, just as vaccines were really coming out and we were aware that they were coming, um, you know, we had about 10% of people who were really, you know, mm, no, I'm probably not going to vaccinate. Um, and then you have the other group there that were a bit unsure. And we can see that that has fluctuated over the course. So if we think about when Astra, the announcement about AstraZeneca for people under 60 was made, which was late May, early June, you can see there was a little bit of a blip in people going, look, no, thank you. I don't think I'm keen to get vaccinated. So all that messaging really plays an impact. But the other thing we can see is that sort of when we're getting to the end of last year, those rates of people that weren't going to be vaccinated or still sure has dropped below 10%. So we've actually come a really long way over that trajectory, a really short interval of just over a year. Okay, so first two A, so access and affordability. So what we know is that if it is convenient for people to get vaccinated, that is going to increase our vaccination rates. And different communities have different needs in terms of access and affordability. So obviously the government went a big one, Vaccines are free, regardless of if you have Medicare, you don't have Medicare, or why you're in Australia, you can access a free COVID vaccination somewhere. 
We also legislated that doctors can't charge a fee for the provision of a COVID vaccine. So we can't charge for the vaccine and we cannot charge for the consultation therein. We made it many options. We had pharmacies, we had GP clinics, we had hubs, we had pop-ups going out everywhere that were available. So there was lots of options for people of how they were going to access their vaccine. So if you're a clinic that's not providing COVID vaccines or you've decided to wind back your COVID vaccination programs, it's really important that you still know where those vaccines can be accessed for your population. So nearby GP clinics and community health centres that may be doing it. Um, obviously, a lot of the vaccination hubs are now starting to be wound back, but there are still some around. Pharmacies still doing quite a lot and, you know, quite a varied. Obviously, they've got Moderna as well. Um, and pop-up clinics. So I do strongly suggest following the Northwest Melbourne PHN Facebook page. They do post up there quite regularly when pop-up clinics are being run. Bunnings, we know, is a really big one. A lot of sporting grounds and community centres as well. The other thing that's worth mentioning is you can do flu vaccinations on the same day as a COVID vaccination. That's absolutely fine. They do need to be at different sites, though. So you're going to go opposing deltoids um, if you are going to co-administer. The other thing that's worth mentioning is you can bill concurrently for the COVID-19 vaccination items and standard consultation items, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. So let's find our patients who need boosters. That's basically going to be the big cohort that you're looking at at the moment. So opening your pen cat, you've got your data set. I always restrict it to my active patients. Um, they're the ones that we're seeing and I really have a responsibility to for to make sure that they have as much information they have to make that decision for themselves. So if we come down here, we can see that there's the immunizations tab. And under the immunizations tab, we have our COVID-19 reports. So what I've highlighted here is the people that are due for a booster who are at an increased risk from COVID. And what I can see out of my 571 people who are deemed to be at risk, I've got 307 where I don't know if they've had a booster or not. And this is the thing to remember, this is picking up data from your software. So out of my 307 patients, Probably quite a lot have had a booster, but I need to reference that information against the AIR to pick that information up. So I'm going to pick up this bundle of people by clicking on them and go, okay, here's my at-risk people that have not had a COVID booster that I know about. On my next page, I can also then highlight the people that I know are still due their flu vaccination. So what I come down here under my immunizations tab, we come under influenza. I look at my general cohort. So I've picked my COVID at risk cohort, but now I'm going to my influenza, just everybody. So those two groups will combine. So I'm going to pick the people that I've given flu shots to before. So the ones that I know come in, see me for flu, that's my first target. You can expand out to just everyone if you want to, but depending on the size of your clinic, those numbers might be untenable. So we, I'm going to pick with a smaller, smaller cohort that I can target and I know that I've provided those services in the past. So I've highlighted my COVID groups. I'm also now going to highlight my flu people that I gave their flu shot last year or the years before. And I'm going to come up here to my report button. When I hit that report, it's going to collate the data. Who are those people out of those two groups that I have selected? And when I publish my report, now obviously this is a de-identified report, so I don't have any of the information I need to contact it. You will when you pull the data from your non-identifiable your report. And what it goes us over here is our vaccine history. So we can see when they've had their first COVID vaccinations. I can see why are they why are they considered to be at risk in terms of PenCat software? So PenCat we're using the category 1A, 1B. Um, back, back then when we had a roadmap and we were following the roadmap, that's the data that they're using to consider people at risk. We also look at their most recent dose date from their flu vaccination or their and their COVID vaccine. So it gives us both of those information. So we can go, okay, these are the people that I need to target. So the other thing that can improve access, do you have a large population of people that actually receive home visits and may actually benefit from a home visit service? There is a home visit 
COVID vaccination service where they will go in and they will vaccinate people at home. That can be arranged by ringing the coronavirus hotline or if they are a person with a disability, you can email the disability liaison officers at the Department of Health on that email there to arrange a home visit. Um, down here, I've just popped in who is actually eligible for a home visit. So if it's for the primary course, everybody. If it's for the booster, it's only for people with an underlying disability or health condition, if they're between five and 59, or if they're age 60 and over, it's everybody. So I think the thing to remember here is we're not delineating by who gets to have a home visit, we're actually delineating by who gets a booster. So basically, if there's a reason that they need to have their vaccine at home, they can access that service. How we find these patients. So the first thing is we know there are separate item numbers for doing home visits. So I've given you your table here. So generally you're going to be doing a 24, a 37 or a 47. What we can then do in PENCAT is we can filter. So if you come up here where it says MBS attendance and you can select the item numbers here, who's getting those visits. So you can select your 24, your 37, your 47. When you click recalculate, it will then bring up your patients who have had a home visit, who fit in the category of not having a booster recorded. Now, I, we don't, we've, I think I've done three home visits in the last 12 months, so not useful data. But when you do that population group, your table will then change to show which of those patients that have had a home visit are still due a booster. And that you know, shortened your list of, okay, are these people that I could organise someone to go out to their home to get that booster done? Um, the other thing is, how many of your patients are coming to see you after hours if you have an after hours service? So again, using that MBS filter, you can filter by the item numbers for after hours. If you have a significant population of people who do come and see you after hours who are also still due boosters, is it worth your clinic running an after hours booster, uh, you know, COVID session? or talking to your doctors that do the after hours service and going, okay, well, you've got all these patients coming in to see you that haven't had their boosters. If I draw them up and they're in the fridge, can you please really try and push those through? Okay. So looking at two more of our A's, awareness and acceptance. Um, do people know they need a COVID vaccine? Obviously, and I don't know how you guys feel, really early on in the piece, the languages other than English information wasn't really readily available and really wasn't being updated at the speed at which information was being released. There's groups of the population that may not be sure about what they're meant to be doing in terms of boosters and everything else. So making sure that that information is available. Um, not only culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds but also health literacy so we know that's a really big thing is that information actually available to them can they understand what they're being told making sure that there's resources that are targeted for that group available for those people the other thing we can look at is barriers to acceptance so obviously the big one particularly early on in the piece was worries about safety and side effects you know that idea that the process had been rushed and there wasn't enough research about the vaccine so we know with the vaccines that we have on the market in Australia they have all been through phase three trials so they have been through the exact same processes that every other medication does what happens is that lag period between phases was shortened. So usually you would run a phase one trial to look at safety. Can we actually give this vaccine without causing huge issues? Usually what would happen is your phase one trials would complete. There would be a period in between where reports were made, research was published, then phase three trials would be run. Okay, it's safe. Does it work? Perfect. Let's run those phase two trials. Again, stop, research, publish. Then phase three trials. Let's expand it out to a wider population. Is it a public health benefit? What happened with COVID vaccines is those reporting periods were shortened. As soon as sufficient data was available from the previous phase of trials, the next phase of trials began. So they have still gone through all the processes they would need to go through. It's just that we've shortened the red tape so that we could get these things on the market. Yes, in terms of long term, we, we don't know. Theoretically, though, looking at the way that these vaccines have been made, 
we can't say, yes, this is definitely going to be happen. Yes, this definitely won't happen. But what we can look at goes, theoretically, there's nothing there that should cause long-term issues. Um, we do have options. So I think a lot of hesitancy was around the mRNA vaccinations because it was relatively new technology. Nothing using this technology had been brought to market. So that's where your AstraZeneca and your new Vaxovid using more traditional methods are a good option for those patients where that is their concern. Um, perceived benefit. Now I'm healthy, my immune system's really good. I don't get sick, I don't need a vaccine. Excellent, glad you've got a good immune system. Not everyone does, you're part of a community. Also COVID, not like other diseases. We can make a guess about who they're going to, who's going to get serious illness, who's going to end up with complications. There are large swathes of healthy people that are getting quite severe COVID and who are developing long COVID. The other trade-off too is we look at people that are worried about the long-term effect of the vaccine. What are the long-term effects of COVID? Look at rheumatic fever, starts as an illness, later down the track you're looking at a mitral valve repair. So we don't know what those long-term issues with COVID infections are going to be. There are, it comes both ways. Healthcare provider trust. So <laughs> Funnily enough, the evidence said that healthcare providers were more trusted than politicians when talking about COVID and vaccines. I think we all saw that coming. If you have a really good relationship with your patients and you are their regular provider, they are going to value your opinion. They may still go away and think about it and access other sources, but your opinion and your value has weight. And that's a really big part of the decision of why the vaccination mandates were made for healthcare workers because it's not just about us being protected, us not getting it, disabling the system because we don't have enough healthcare workers, us passing it on to patients, causing harm. We all said that we're not going to cause harm to our patients. The other thing is if you have people that are not vaccinating and are going through alternative statements about vaccine and safety, and I am a nurse immuniser. I've been a nurse immuniser for over 10 years. I don't do research. I trust the people doing the research who then publish this stuff for me to read. And that's what I talk to my patients about. I don't trust Pete Evans on much at all, particularly not vaccines. The other thing that we know has a really big impact on people choosing to vaccinate is their previous vaccination experiences, particularly childhood immunisation is a really big thing for adults choosing to be vaccinated. So trying to work through, it may not be an issue with the COVID vaccine, it might be an issue with being vaccinated at all. Is there a way that we can help those people, you know, making a longer appointment, giving time, do they want to bring a support person in, going through their concerns, you know, letting them know, look, if you come in and it doesn't get done because we just can't, that's okay. We can make another time. Making that a safe service that you are providing for those people. Okay, so let's have a look at some barriers of awareness and acceptance that we can categorise with PEDCAT. So increased risk of hospitalisation. So I think everyone thinks, oh, you know, they were old. Obviously, they're going to be at risk. Oh, they're on, you know, medications for cancer. They're going to be at risk. Let's have a look at some other things. Being pregnant, you have some immunosuppression when you're pregnant. Doesn't bode well for viral infections. Men, more likely to get complications of COVID than women. Also heart disease and diabetes. Um, if they've had cancer in childhood, that, you know, even if they're recovered, fully in remission, never had any problems since, linked to higher rates of complications with COVID later on. Ones that I think are interesting, so poorly controlled hypertension. So your 50 something year old bloke who doesn't take his tablets for his blood pressure regularly, high risk of complications from COVID. People with a BMI of over 40, myself included, high risk of complications from COVID. There are things where people may not realize that they're at risk. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. How many of your patients have really whacked out LFTs? Potentially a higher risk of complications from COVID. So actually letting those people know that actually you're in that cohort of people who may not do well if you get COVID. So the other thing, do are we addressing those cultural and language groups in our population that might need access to resources in their first language? So in COVID, uh, in COVID, in PENCAT, you can actually go by language group or by ethnicity profile. 
So it is part of your accreditation standards that you are asking this information. Um, I think for those of you that are using best practice, it gives you the option for ethnicity. The thing to remember, not just with COVID vaccines, but also in terms of your diabetes risk, what we're looking for actually is country of birth, regardless of when they then migrated to Australia. So for my patients, we talk about ethnicity, but I also ask them, where were you born? Because that's going to play an impact further down the track um, for lots of things. Um, so I have a very white population. I work in the middle of Brunswick. This is not surprising. Um, so I do have a few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, but the vast majority of my patients are Australian, non-Indigenous background, um, English, and some Arabic patients as well. So for my clinic, having resources available in English and Arabic has been okay, and our vaccination rates are pretty good. If you're working sort of out of Western suburbs or in the further north, your profile may be different. Are there languages there that you can pop some stuff out in the waiting room that's accessible for people? They don't have to ask you. They can just take it, have a bit of a read process that in their own time. This is a really easy way to find out, are we actually giving the stuff that we need to the people that we need to. Okay, last A, activation. Those people that are like, yeah, I think I will get vaccinated. How do we give them the little nudge to take the plunge, get the jab, good on you? So we can do reminders, SMS, email, letter, really good. Um, the other thing with those is they're really time intensive, particularly if you're doing sort of letters, it's really money intensive. We have better things that we could be spending $1.10 per patient on. Opportunistic reminders are also effective activators. So having that note in the file, oh, I can see you haven't had your COVID jab yet, or you do if you're a booster, you know, do you feel comfortable doing it today? Would you like me to make an appointment to come back? It doesn't also have to be just us. It can be from other trusted sources. So community leaders, religious leaders, PHN did a really fantastic um, multilingual rollout video for our main languages in our catchment area of pro vaccination information, which is great, pardon me. The other thing remembering, we can co-claim our items. So there's not that restriction of, oh, you're coming in your flu shot. Well, I can't do your COVID shot today. You'll have to come back another day. No, let's get it done. They're here, talk to them. You only have to do one round of side effects. How great's that? Let's get it done. So. Let's have a look at how can we do this opportunistically. We are going to be doing a series starting in June on delayed care. We all know that we've now seen the onslaught of all the people we probably haven't seen for the better part of two years. We have opportunities now to actually see people. We're, you know, we're doing more face-to-face, -face, telehealth's now being permanent. Hooray! We've got those options to really go, oh, you know, I'll just have a quick look at your file while I'm here. What else needs doing? Are we calling our people back in for health assessments? This really died off over the pandemic, we know. Let's get those people back in. Let's make it part of our health assessments. You know, heart disease risk, diabetes risk, have you had your COVID booster? The other thing that we can look at, and we all love because it's a money spinner, is care plans. Wonderful. Let's come in. Let's talk about your back pain. Have you had your booster? We can do that on the same day. We can co-claim that item. That's A-OK. -okay. So... I hope that's all inspired you, that you have found new passion for finding those people and getting them their boosters so we can stay out of lockdown. I have popped some resources at the end for you. So the first one is just the guidance on those people who needs that third primary dose, who needs that fourth booster in terms of immunocompromised. This gives you the list, goes through everything. Um, in terms of keeping abreast of ATAGI updates and what the clinical recommendations are, health.gov.au, that's where that information then gets translated and put up as soon as it comes out. Um, I've put some information on MBS item claiming and co-claiming of what you can and can't do um, with your COVID vaccine items, just in terms of with your GPs to go back and say to them, well, this is what we can. Yes, you can do it on the same day. Please jab people or I'm coming for you. Um, if you would like to have a read through the COVID-19 vaccination strategy working paper, that's the reference down the bottom. It is well worth a read. It's really, it's not super researchy. It's got some really good practical stuff. Just a general vaccination as well. So well worth a bit of your time. And you can put it on your CPD report because we're coming up to the end of the CPD period. And I've also popped on the PENCAT resources. So you, obviously you can access them through the help menu in PENCAT. But if you're at home and you're like, oh, I was going to look that thing up today, 
these are your websites. And if you're really stuck, get in contact with Pencat. You can flick them an email, you can give them a call on their 1800 number, which is free. So, questions. Is there anything you would like to know? Feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll monitor that one. And I'll just pop back over to Yvonne. So, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Nestle. Very informative. Thank you very much. I can't see anyone with any questions in the chat. Please, this is your opportunity. We've got Natalie here. She's got lots of knowledge on lots of things. Put it to the test is what I say. <laughs> the other thing that's in there that you'll see is there's also a brief evaluation survey. So you can provide feedback. Um, Always really interested if there's webinars or things you would like us to cover as well. I know Yvonne is a font of knowledge for all things that are amazing. Um, and I'm more than happy to come on and jump and talk about things that you want to know. Put, put my many years of working in general practice to good use. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll ask you a question. So we've looked at... Um, COVID vaccines, influenza, pretty much the same sort of concept, I would say. Um, how are you going with all the influenza shots and getting pa patients into practice? Are you having any resistance because, you know, they're all um, immunised out? <laughs> I must admit I was quite surprised. I really thought that there was, and I think particularly a lot of the literature and sort of the talk was that we were potentially going to be coming up to a lot of vaccine fatigue and needle fatigue and people are just like, now nah, I'm done, I just don't want any more needles. Um, but take here has been pretty good. I think as soon as, and obviously we've all now swapped to online ordering for our government vaccines, which has been fun, transition. Um, Uptake for people that usually get vaccinated is still pretty good for my clinic. Um, where the people that I would see every year, I'm still seeing. In terms of people that, you know, some years they do, some years they don't, I, I actually haven't had to do a lot of encouragement for people to get vaccinated, which has surprised me and I'm really pleased about. Um, I think it is just keeping people in the front of their mind that flu is still important. Um, and I did a session, yeah, I did do a session. I did a session last month on flu vaccination. I'm trying to think which ones have I done, which one am I about to do? Um, that the link to that webinar is on the Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network page. So you can actually go back and re-watch me talk about flu. Um, but I think as long as we sort of bring it to people, most people are still pretty keen. And I think, you know, I'm really selling it too of, you know, you've had all these COVID, look at this, let's get this one last one in and protect you against all of the viruses. Um, also a good time to talk about hepatitis if you do too. Um, so certainly it's been a lot better than I thought it was going to be. So, which I'm really pleased. I am happy to be proven wrong in this case. So that's really good. Amazing, amazing. And, and yes, that's, that's a good point to remind everybody that all of our sessions and Natalie has done a few for us. They are all on our website. So they, most of our sessions are recorded and you can view them later. So this session, you will receive a link to this session um, as soon as we have it on our website. So you can share with your colleagues and just go through and have another look um, at what we presenting. And we're sending the slides as well. So the slides and all the links. So if you didn't get to write all the links down, um, they will be on our slides when we send them through. So we're 155 and we still don't have any questions. So we must have covered everything perfectly, I would say. So I might say thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Olivia, for being in the background and helping us out, politely making sure we run perfectly. Um, and thank you, everybody that has joined us. Um, please complete the surveys and, and let us know what else you want to hear about from us. Um, and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Big thank you to Yvonne and Natalie. You guys absolutely smashed it. That was such an informative presentation. So pat on the back to you guys as well. Thank you, Olivia.